Bienvenue to us. Welcome to Reporters. Chile is in the grip of unprecedented protests. Not since the end of dictatorship have the streets of the capital of Santiago seen such scenes. Violence of the state police against the protesters at such a level that the United Nations is raising concerns. At the root of the problem, a total breakdown in the system of society in Chile. President Sebastián Piñera has offered changes. None have changed the resolve of the demonstrators. Well, Ingrid Piponio is our reporter. She joins us now. Ingrid, it's clearly a rejection of Piñera's government, but how uh, much further do the protesters' demands go? Well, indeed, what, what we have seen and heard in the streets clearly shows a massive rejection of the actual system as a whole, which has not changed since the Pinochet dictatorship that ended 30 years ago. So they still have the same constitution and the same extremely pro-market policies, including liberalization of trade and finance, an extremely regressive tax system, but also privatization of water, education, health, and actually most social services. So it has been 45 years of free market fundamentalism, and the result is deep social inequality. And that is why people in the streets are shouting, Chile woke up. Because after 30 years of democracy, they seem to be finally dreaming of a new Chile, as you will see in our report. Ingrid, thank you very much indeed. So with no further ado, let's see Ingrid's report. This is a scene that has become common in central Santiago. Every day for the past month, the Plaza Italia has been overrun with hundreds of thousands of demonstrators who have come to protest a deeply unequal society, undermining a view at the very foundation of society. It is the same here every day. The protests are out in full force. The Chilean government responds with force and disperses the crowd with tear gas. And that's the only answer we have from the state. We wouldn't be here if they provided us with health, safety, education, good jobs. Watch out, move over. The demonstrators try to resist the asphyxiating smoke. But gradually, tensions rise and the plaza empties out. Ultimately, the most radical remain. They are mostly young students ready to fight the police despite the often violent response. Watch out, they're moving forward. Julie is one of the few activists who dares to defy the police. In the morning, she is a saleswoman in a store in a wealthy part of Santiago. And in the afternoon, she immerses herself in the protest to document police brutality. Did you see how they shot him in the chest? It was right in the chest. Police officers do not hesitate to shoot at close range with anti-riot projectiles. Julie takes note of their ID number and then retrieves the cartridges they leave behind. That's how they respond to those who go out to protest by hitting pots and pans and some young people who throw stones. Since the beginning of the protest, more than 1,500 people have been wounded and 20 killed in violent clashes, including at least five killed by live ammunition. Not to mention the 4,300 violent and often arbitrary arrests. Do you want to go with him? Come on, let's take you in. Beatings and serious human rights violations have been reported daily since the beginning of the protests. But what happens to these demonstrators once they are arrested? On the outskirts of Santiago, we have an appointment with a 33-year-old man. His name is Ignacio, and he is traumatized by his experiences. Do you have Ignacio's video? 
His friends filmed the entirety of the arrest while they were participating in a peaceful march in his neighborhood. They hit me behind their vans to torture me without anyone seeing. And they hit me and hit me again. I thought they were going to kill me. After being beaten up for 20 minutes, Ignacio got away with bruises, about 10 stitches on his skull, and a sprained wrist. He now works as a store clerk in an animal shop and lives with his father. He can't afford to rent a place of his own. I saw a video on the internet of a tortured young man tripping over as he came out of a van, and all of a sudden, I recognized my son. I felt like I was reliving the 1973 coup d'etat. At that time, they would have just killed him. How can we be so cruel to each other? Ignacio and his father decided to file a complaint with the National Institute of Human Rights, an organization created in the aftermath of the dictatorship to judge crimes committed by the armed forces. I will forbid the police to come near your house, and I will give you a phone to use urgently if you ever receive threats for reporting this case of torture. Words and methods that call back to mind the dictatorship. Thirty years later, Chile is once again facing the ghosts of this dark era. We have many cases of beatings, sexual assaults, arbitrary arrests, which include people who have been arrested. Since the beginning of the protests, the Institute's lawyers have initiated nearly 200 legal proceedings. Despite merciless repression, the size of demonstrations continue to increase across the country. Valparaíso, the second largest city in Chile. Here, the Senate, now barricaded, is still smoky from the past protests. Conservative politicians, allies of President Piñera, are trying to calm the situation with palliative measures. This is a bill that freezes electricity rates to compensate for the significant price increase we had anticipated. It's not only an economic and social divide, there's also the worst of inequalities, there's a lack of respect, and that's what we see in the violent demonstrations. Following President Piñera's lead, Kenneth Pug insists solely on maintaining public order. Now you'll see that there's a demonstration. From here we have a good angle of view. We can't go down because they attack the press and parliamentarians. We have to be very careful. Outraged by the acts of vandalism, this senator turned a deaf ear to the demands of the street. He prefers to show us this cathedral, ransacked during a demonstration. Look, the anarchists have written, the only church that illuminates is the one that burns. These people are spreading fire and terror. For Kenneth Pug, the damage caused by the demonstrators fully justifies police repression. I was 13 years old when the coup took place in 1973. Certainly, at that time, the government was authoritarian. But we've never seen such high levels of aggression in demonstrations. And of course, when such restless crowds hit with stones, sticks and Molotov cocktails, we have to contain them. On the streets, demonstrators are demanding profound reforms of the ultra-liberal economic model and the abolition of privileges. 
Because in Chile, 1% of the population owns 30% of the wealth. Many businessmen invested in real estate in developing districts of Valparaíso. We just bought all these hills, all the way to the end there. Fernando made a fortune in real estate. As a businessman, he benefited from Chile's growth in GDP and tax breaks for the wealthy. But today, he fears for the stability of the national economy. No one expected it. We thought we were in a quiet country, the best economy in Latin America. It's obviously affected us. Production is now slow. On weekends, Fernando visits his 240 hectare estate here, an hour and a half from Santiago. Coming from a family of pioneering entrepreneurs, he maintains a tradition and works with his three children. But even in privileged circles, the demonstrations have opened a debate on the viability of Chilean-style neoliberalism. It has to be said that we have privatized everything, roads, water, electricity. Well, privatization does have some good aspects. It's given us a lot of growth. After that, it is true that it can be unfair to some people. But I think we should not touch the free market. The state cannot give people gifts. It's better to give them the tools so that they can generate wealth. To bridge the social divide, will the economic elite be willing to share their piece of the pie? Back near Santiago, in Quilicura, a commuter town for the capital. This is where the Herreras live, one of the many families left behind by this country's economic model. Here, all the leftovers are reused, nothing is thrown away. Like many Chileans, this middle-class family has gone into debt. Retirement, health, education, everything is privatized in Chile. With four children and no jobs, this couple owes the bank 270,000 euros. We had to remortgage the house. At the moment, I'm paying 50% of my debt, but the other 50%, I don't know when I'll get there. One in three households cannot afford to repay their loans to the bank. For the grandfather, the situation has deteriorated considerably. Even dying has become too expensive in this country. You have to buy the location of your grave with loans, and if you don't pay your monthly payments, they dig you up and throw you in the mass grave. They even make money with the dead. Every week since the beginning of the dispute, the Herrera family has continued to share their frustration with hundreds of thousands of other Chileans and tear gas no longer frightens them. They try to silence us because my generation has lived so long in silence and in fear. Our aims are legitimate. In the end, it is us who form this nation, not those who lead it from above. They just want to stay in power. And it's sad to think that they will continue to repress us instead of listening to us. Led by young people, Chile has woken up. The population is now demanding the resignation of conservative president Sebastián Piñera. Despite government concessions and the resignation of several ministers, anger has not subsided. The country's pain runs too deep. Well, Ingrid Papadio is still with us. Uh, Ingrid, thank you very much for that fascinating insight into what's happening in Chile right now. Uh, it's clear from the report there's a real disillusionment and anger across Chile. Give us some of the statistics behind this. Yes, so Chile is actually the seventh most unequal country in the world, according to the Gini Index, which measures income inequality. The 140 wealthiest people in Chile own almost 20% of the nation's wealth. And this in a country where three out of four workers 
earn less than 570 euros per month, and the cost of living is similar to Europe. So these numbers explain the, the social anger that got to the point where some protesters attacked symbols of capitalism. Many banks have been burned down, but also some small businesses owned by middle class families. So we met some of them who were wearing yellow vests as a sign of protest. And they said that actually they actually support the social demands, but they are losing everything because of the looting and the vandalism. Yesterday, the shop at the corner was burned. We were all there. They came, they threatened us, saying that they would burn everything, and they did it. Four of our neighbors lost everything. They found themselves in the street. This jeweler, how old is he? 70, 80 years old? He is on the street now. We do night patrols, and we have to be armed. When we say armed, it's with sticks. Sticks, iron bars, anything we find. They are thugs, but they do a lot of damage, and above all, they eclipse all the demands. The whole struggle of this social movement, we really are desperate. Some thoughts there from uh, the street. The uh, UN Human Rights Commissioner Michelle Bachelet has raised her concerns about the violence that's been shown by the security forces in Chile. An investigation is underway. She herself was once, of course, president of Chile. I'm wondering in the past, Ingrid, whether, say, under Mich Michelle Bachelet, uh, whether people were any better off in Chile. Yes, yeah, so at the beginning, Michelle Bachelet did create great hope in Chile. As a, as a socialist, people expected her to put an end to the neoliberal heritage from the Pinochet dictatorship, and she was elected with many ambitious ideas. She promised 50 reforms in 100 days, including a new constitution, tuition-free college education, but also pension and tax reforms. But none of her structural reform promises got off the ground mainly because they got blocked by Congress, but also because the economy slowed down during her second term. And that is why Piñera got elected in 2018, with the promise to bring back economic growth at the expense of reducing inequalities. Ingrid Piponio, thank you very much uh, indeed. And of course, you can see uh, Ingrid's report again via our website, www.france24.com. This is reporters. Thank you very much for watching and stay with us.